When Sidney Poitier arrived in Hollywood, the rules were already written, but he rewrote them, forever changing the way African Americans would be depicted on the big screen. The best way to understand the legacy of Sidney Poitier is that he is the man in between. He's between black and white. He's a man between representing the system and trying to subvert it. Sidney Poitier was born three months premature in Miami, Florida in 1927, but spent most of his childhood in the Bahamas. The future in Nassau looked so bleak for the son of a poor tomato farmer that his parents sent him off to Miami to live with his older brother. Things weren't much better stateside. With a limited education and no real prospects, young Sidney made his way up to New York. Looking for work in the big city, he read an ad that mentioned the American Negro Theater in Harlem was looking for actors. He showed up and auditioned, but with his thick accent and difficulty reading, he was immediately rejected. He took a job as a dishwasher and worked hard to shake his accent by listening to the radio while a coworker helped him with his reading. His persistence and determination paid off when he was accepted by the theater six months later. As the 40s came to a close, Sidney made the jump from the stage to the screen. Performances in the racially charged No Way Out and 1955's Blackboard Jungle made him one of the most talked about young actors in film. By 1958, he earned an Academy Award nomination for his role in The Defiant Ones. It was a kind of allegory on civil rights in the late 1950s that black and white could not survive together unless they held on to each other. Guys, uh, welcome to another scriptly adapted episode, but this time it's a little different. We, uh, we have a, a, a series called Legends and Icons where we you know, take an actor or an actress of prestige or some of greatness and we chronicle their career, mm -hmm. a little bit about their lives, and we bring that to you, the people, so you guys get to know them a little more than you did before. And yeah. as you saw from that clip, as you saw from that clip, we are doing none other, or, or chronicling the life of none other than Sir Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. uh, great actor, great film actor, uh, <coughs> director, uh, even philanthropist in yep. some sorts, mm -hmm. um, a man of great, great achievement and great prestige in his career. Absolutely. What do you Absolutely. think? Um, Sidney Poitier is iconic. Um, he's really just an all-around classy man, um, a, an amazing actor. He has the respect from his uh, counterparts in mm -hmm. Hollywood, both black and white. Um, he's just really cemented uh, a really fruitful career for himself. Right. And he's 89 years old, so he's been acting um, since he was, oh God, I think at least in his late teens, early right. 20s. Now, Sidney, uh, not only has he um, paved the way for many actors today, black and white, mm -hmm. um, but he's also done uh, so many things as far as his early career. Yep. Um, in his early career, uh, Sidney, you know, he came from, he was born in Miami, um, his parents were for, from the Bahamas, mm -hmm. uh, and he came to New York with a dream. Yep. And he joined the American Negro Theater yep. in New York City. Yep. And that is where he started to really develop his craft, develop yep. who he was as an actor. And I read something very interesting. In that theater, he traded lessons. Uh, he cleaned the office or, and, and the space lessons. Yeah, yeah. So that showed you the kind of determination he was trying to do as far as getting his name out and becoming a star. Right. Um, but as he was doing that, he got, you know, chances to become uh, noticed mm -hmm. by many people in the industry. Uh, his first film, I believe, was uh, that he really was noticed and billed on uh, was Blackboard Jungle. Um, it was almost your, your, your take on the lean on me. Of, yes, of that. You're I thought the same thing the when I heard about that. that. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. it's an unruly school yep. um, with unruly uh, uh, classmates and a teacher who comes in and he tries to build the school up again mm -hmm. and, and, and create uh, a nice school for everybody and, and try to change the lives of those young people. Right. Yeah, I mean, 
Sidney Poitier, like I said, has had a very illustrious career. Obviously, he's had to have his breakthroughs somehow. Right. Um, Blackboard Jungle was just the first. Um, but then he really got got hooked with something. Yep. And it was, I think it was that pivotal moment in his career where he realized, this is it. Like, this is, I'm really going to get recognized for mm -hmm. this. Um, and that was The Defiant Ones in 1958. Um, oh, such a good movie. Yeah, I such mean, it movie. was so brilliant. It really spoke to race relations, um, something, you know, this country can really relate to now um, and has been able to relate to. Um, he starred opposite Tony Curtis. Uh, who, for those of you who don't know, little useless cocktail party trivia, is Jamie Lee Curtis's dad. Jamie Lee Curtis, the um, queen of Scream. Yes, the queen, queen of, of Scream, but she's another show. Anyway, um, <laughs> it was directed by Stanley Kramer, and basically a brief synopsis was you have John Joker Jackson, who's played by Tony Curtis, right. and Noah Cullen, who's played by Sidney Poitier. Um, they're criminals, they're inmates, and they're being transported on a bus, and the bus gets into an accident, and they're trying to escape, and they hate each other. Um, pretty much because one man is black and one man is white. And the story is really how, and as you saw in the first clip, um, the historian was speaking about how it really gave the impression of how blacks and whites needed to work together in order right. to survive. Right. And that's really what the film is about. Um, just a little trivia for you regarding the movie. Tony Curtis insisted that Sidney Poitier receive top billing, which for those of you that not, don't know what that is, on any program or any movie poster, his name will appear first. Um, and that was major That's for the major, times, major. Guys. I mean, this I mean, is 1958, guys. 1958. This is, you know. Race relations yeah, are still a little huge. touchy. Um, and for Tony Curtis, who at that time was a huge actor himself. Yeah. I mean, he was mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Um, it, it, it took a... I wouldn't say it took a lot, but maybe it did. We don't know him personally, but maybe it took a <laughs> lot for him to give him that and be yeah. like, "Hey, listen, I'm gonna, I want you to have top billing on this." And I feel like that was a show of respect. Mm -hmm. um, some may say it was just to um, not seem like he was like everybody else in the thinking of race relations or what is this black man doing here? Like some people might think that, yeah. but Tony really took took himself and his career on a whim here and and stepped out for. Uh, Sidney Poitier to make him part, but I also feel think, part of the movie. I think it was genuine because another piece of trivia that I learned was that Tony Curtis felt during the filming of the movie that the director Stanley Kramer was showed favoritism to Sidney Poitier, um, but he never felt a certain type of way about it. He was quoted as saying, um, "Sidney was a hell of a talent, no matter what color he was." And this was a time when Hollywood was just starting to realize maybe mm. it could do something positive for civil rights. Mm. So I think he understood that he was a breakthrough talent. Right. Um, so that's a little bit of information about the Defiant Ones. Mm -hmm. um, on to Porgy and Bess. This was huge for him, and it's now on broad. It was on Broadway, it was on Broadway for a little Broadway while. For a little while. Um, it was in 1959. It was directed by Otto Preminger and mm. Ruben Mamoulian, who actually was uncredited. And this was now the second time that Ruben Mamoulian was um, overstepped by Otto Preminger. Interesting. Um, so and Otto had a big voice in the entertainment. Oh yeah, I mean he I was mean. huge. Um, basically, this movie is about a character named Porgy, who was played by Claudia McNeil. Um, and she, I'm sorry, she was played by Dorothy Dandridge. Sorry, wrong film. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and basically, it was about a character named Bess who mm -hmm. was trying to escape um, free of her brutish lover. So basically, right. you know, he was abusive, okay? Right. And she had a disrep disreputable reputation. So for those of you that know what it means, she basically wasn't favored very highly within her community. Mm -hmm. And the only person that would take her in was crippled Porgy, who was played by Sidney Poitier. Right. Um, it was a very, very, another very breakthrough film of its time. Um, it just went above to show that people of different, you know, people who are different can come together realizing that they have same interests. Absolutely. You know? Um, it was interesting, too, because... Dorothy Dandridge, Sidney Poitier, did not want to initially be in the film. Um, Sidney Poitier specifically said that he thought that it perpetuated the stereotypes of blacks of that right. era. Um, Sammy Davis Jr. was the only one that was looking forward to being in the film. Um, and Sammy at the time could have been a great pick as well because he was going through some really hard times as well. I mean, he, was, he had a yeah. name. Uh, he was with the Rat Pack. Uh -huh. uh, mm -hmm. But still, he was not respected in his craft. And to see Sammy or to hear Sammy want to do that film 
uh, didn't surprise me in a way. Right. Like it, it, he wanted to step out and have people see who he was and 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 be glorified for the talent that he truly mm -hmm. was. And I'm glad that Sydney did it because it was also another huge stepping stone, as well as Dorothy Dandridge, who at the time was huge. Oh, huge, and she's huge, iconic, beautiful, in her own iconic right. woman. Yeah, um, in her own right, in film and dance and song. And yep. I'm glad they did it. Um, Columbia Pictures actually wanted to buy the film in 1942 to be cast as an all-white cast in blackface. Hmm. Uh, we're very grateful that that did not happen. Um, and it was eventually sold, uh, sold to Samuel Goldwyn in 1957. Um, so on to one of the biggest films in stage plays um, of its time is A Raisin in the Sun oh. in 1961. I Classic. remember going to see this film, uh, the stage play, right. in high school. and. I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with the book. Um, it was written by Lorraine Hansberry, mm -hmm. who was an African-American author as well. Um, and it was just, it's basically a brief synopsis about an, a black family living yeah. um, and how the mother character, the maternal character in it, is expecting this huge t check from her deceased husband mm -hmm. um, of $10,000. And it's basically the story about how each family member has ideas and dreams of their own of how they would use this ten thousand dollars without consulting without consulting each with, other with and mom each other or their yeah, mom yeah yeah I mean it's the story of the youngers but what the movie the movie is so much deeper than that because it's basically and it it's actually the title is from Langston Hughes's Harlem uh, what happens to a dream deferred mm -hmm. and if you know about that poem that poem really speaks to what happens if you put a dream off if you don't indulge in your desires and so the film is very it's very ironic that the film is about that because yes. it's oh it's all about what would each person do with that money? Mm -hmm. You know, should we put off our dreams or and should you, we use it? And you know, Kate, it also in a, on a social issue shows you the the um, uh, I guess the mindset of a of a family who's poor mm -hmm. who gets this big amount of yep. money mm -hmm. and they don't know really what to do with it. Right. And that's happening in some communities now with uh -huh. some actors who are young. Who are, who are black or African American who are whatever, who get lump sums of money, who are getting this fame and don't know how to use it to, I guess, live on or... or to, right, there's or, no legacy. There's no legacy right. after that. So it was also showing you how this family is going to come together mm -hmm. to um, enjoy the fruits of, their, of, 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 this, of, of this check mm -hmm. and to also live on and, and be prosperous from it and have it grow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, basically, uh, some as we've been saying, some little trivia with this is that the whole cast, Sam, Sidney Poitier, Claudia McNeil, Ruby Dee, Diana Sands, Ivan Dixon, Louis Gossett Jr., mm. and John Fiedler all recreated their roles on stage Amazing. that they had in the film. There was a little bit of animosity between Claudia McNeil and Sidney Poitier because they both had different perspectives. And isn't this, I, I love doing this because isn't mm -hmm. this ironic? The film is about having a different perspective about how you're going to use this money for what dreams and who's right. Right. And yet you have two of the star ca um, actors who have animosity with each other because they both thought of a different perspective for how they thought the play should be told. Mm -hmm. And um, Claudia McNeil thought it should be through her character's perspective and Sidney Poitier thought it should be through his character's right. perspective. Wow. And eventually it was through uh, Walter Younger's perspective, yes. which yes. was who was played by Sidney Poitier. Um, he was nominated for a 1960 Tony Award. Um, and Claudia McNeil did win the Tony of Very 1960. Nice. Yep. Um, last but not least, this was the, I think, the epitome of his career. I think Absolutely. it was basically like the climax of his career was Lilies of the Field, uh, which was made in 1963. Mm -hmm. It was directed by Ralph Nelson, and he won an Oscar for it. Um, it was an amazing film. Uh, it's basically a brief synopsis was you have these nuns, um, in the middle of the Midwest, who need to construct this chapel, yes. or as they say, chapel. Mm -hmm. um, and Sidney Poitier is a black man named Homer Smith who's traveling, and he gets taken in by them, and he sorts, sort of begins to do some odd chores for them here and there, but he gets roped into constructing this chapel Building a for chapel them. for the and, entire, for the nuns. Yeah, Building and it's just their them. relationship and how it evolves because right. they come from very different worlds. Um, now let's not just glance over. Now this was the movie that he won the Oscar for, but yes, he absolutely. was the first African American yes. to uh -huh. win an uh -huh. Academy Award. Yes, and it was for this film, which you know he he was so gracious 
mm -hmm. uh, when accepting. But this film is what I think, not not the uh, not the uh, the climax of his career. I think this really opened the door to his career. Yeah. And I think this made him more confident and gave him a more understanding that his peers did respect his yes, work. Yes, I agree with you and on that. And after this, all the films he started to do uh, started to be, it started to vary in, in, in emotion and levels mm -hmm. of acting, and then he went into so many different ventures, writing yeah. and directing, all that stuff. Well, it, it's interesting because um, it's considered to be one of the 15 films that changed American cinema. Hmm. And, um, you know, he agreed to take a cut in salary um, and agreed to do the film for a smaller amount. Right. And they really appreciated that. Um, it just reminds me of, you know, someone who we all know and love, Spike, Spike, Lee. Spike Lee. You know, he gets people to donate for his films a lot of the time, like Malcolm X, was mm -hmm. all about donations. He didn't have any money to put yeah, up for the that. The people funded it. They, they take risks and they make sacrifices to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. um, interesting trivia for this film, um, since the story's action was tied to the chapel's construction, crew had to work through the night to keep up with the progress <laughs> during the film. Yep. And at the end of the movie, they had a real chapel built, but because it was built on rented property, they had to destroy it after the film was completed. Mm -hmm. um, but we have a clip of yes, this uh, amazing, amazing film. Check it out. Take it out. Schmidt! You did not fasten the pews to the floor. It's done. You must oil the doors so they will not squeak in the mass. It's done. But the rail of the altar you did not fix. Everything is done. Yeah? Yeah. Then it is all finished. It's all finished. I done builded you a chapel. You built me a chapel. Correction. Thank you. Well, it's, it's English lesson time. I build a chapel. I build the chapel. You build a chapel. You build the chapel. Oh, we build a chapel. We build the chapel. He built the chapel. Guys, that was just uh, a clip of Lilies in the Field, uh, Sidney Poitier's Oscar-winning uh, acting film, all right? But now, Sidney not only did uh, some acting, and mm -hmm. he was a brilliant actor, we all know that, uh, but he, after that, he started to dabble into your writing and directing. And one of my favorite films, one <laughs> of my favorite, favorite films film? <laughs> um, of all time, <laughs> my top 10 list, no. But one of my favorite films is Ghost Dad, uh, starring the one and only Bill Cosby. Uh, it was amazing. Listen, I loved it. It was done in 1990. Um, you know, the, the movie was about Bill Cosby, this, this uh, businessman who uh, is so, he's such a workaholic. He, it's about family. He, yep. has three, he has three kids, and he's a widower. So, he, you know, he lost his wife. And uh, long story short, he gets in the cab with a guy who's a Satanist. The guy drives over the uh, bridge. Bill Cosby emerges from the water as a ghost, giving him the name Ghost Dad. How awesome is that? That's Ghost Dad. But I do have to tell you, Ghost Dad was a little rough in the box office. It basically tanked for what would be a tank. It sunk. It, it sunk. It sunk. Badly. Um, but I definitely did buy the movie and watched it, so I'm part of the budget. I'm part of the, uh, the, the, the box office on this. But Ghost Dad was directed by Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. um, studio started to give him the okay and the, red, the, the green light to start producing and, and directing films uh, just based on his his, his, his resume. I mean, yeah. Sidney Poitier, you're gonna tell him no? And at the time, Sidney was sort of weaning down from acting. He wanted to jump into some different things and, and Ghost Dad was one of them. Bill Cosby, definitely check it out. 
it's a cult classic. It's, it it's, definitely is. A it's cult a cult classic. classic. It was very campy, very cute. Very campy. Um, Not we don't expect. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't expect anything uh, magnificent from this film. Simply right. just to, you're gonna have you're gonna have some mm -hmm. certain laughs. It's gonna be a little laughs, mm -hmm. but it's it's still standard. It's a feel good. Uh, then there's another film um, that he did that was really big at the time, and this one was huge. It was yeah. stir crazy. Uh, then this movie was starring. This movie stars. Uh, Richard Pryor, uh -huh, who was a comedic genius, comedic genius, and Gene Wilder, another comedic genius. And this movie came out in 1980, mm -hmm. and it was huge, huge. And I'm talking about these two actors at the time, Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder, were at the top of their game. They were the men, the guys you wanted in your film, especially for a comedy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these two comedic absolutely. geniuses came together, and yep. they played these two. Uh, I feel bad because they weren't really crooks, but they get into <laughs> some mess where they are, for, in, in, I guess, framed for a crime they never committed, and they get a re they get a ridiculous sentence of 125 years in, in prison. And while in prison, they just go crazy, and that's why they call it stir crazy. They just they just have a crazy time trying to escape, trying to get out. And at that at that point, the movie. Grossed about a hundred and something million, a hundred million, mm -hmm. and it was the top-grossing movie of its time. Only two, of course, in the 80s, 1980, The Empire Strikes Back, Star Wars, of course, and the hundred million it made was the most for any African American director at its time. And that's the most important. You had right. a man like Sidney Poitier who, you know, a lot of these actors who make these transitions from actors to directors or writers or producers they don't always succeed. No. It's like an artist coming out with different types of music, right? Um, mm -hmm. You're afraid of what your critics may say of you. And I think that it really spoke to the kind of person he was um, and the kind of director he was. Directors, as we always say, are responsible for pushing their actors, getting them to that place, getting right. them to succeed on screen. And as you had seen with that photo that we put up of him with Richard Pryor, I think it really spoke to the kind of relationship that he had with people that he surrounded himself with. He was just, he, I mean, he is an all-around classy and genuine guy. Right. Um, so it, it definitely, those movies were, you know, his breakout roles for directing. Um, it was, uh, I think, a huge, huge milestone uh, for him. Huge milestone. I yeah. mean, listen, the, the man in the, during this time, uh, literally worked himself to the top mm -hmm. from starting to the bottom, you know, acting classes, being a janitor, like most actors do today, mm -hmm. um, and literally worked his tail off to get to the top of his craft. Mm -hmm. As a black man during this time, he was not only winning awards and Golden Globes, but he was out there producing and writing and directing blockbuster and hits and cult classics. And it's not just Oscar, Golden Globes. He's had a Lifetime Achievement Awards. He's right. had the Kennedy Center Honors. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has been um, he has been a great, great influence in American cinema. Um, so what would you say about his social contributions? So, Kate, uh, social contributions, I mean, we, we talked a lot about it. I mean, he broke down so many color barriers as, as far as through acting and, and through the arts, but also socially with the message that if you put your mind to it and you don't let the negative and you don't let the oppression bring you down, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. You could do anything as, and, and as far as you have the ambition, the will, the talent, and the smarts to do it. Um, but he did also get some, you know, some heat for not being as open and as radical, uh, radical mm -hmm. with his thinking and his 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 um, um, I guess leadership in the black community yeah and he got a lot of he got a lot of stuff for that mm -hmm. um, so that took a toll on him yeah but he didn't let that bring him down so what he did was write books about his experience and taught people and mentored other African Americans and other people period about how to be a good person and how do you let your your talents and your 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 personality mm -hmm. of just being a good person lead you into great things? Totally, um, I think really that that totally sums up 
Sydney Poitier. Um, you know, it's hard to do a 15 or 20 minute right. show on, on, a, on a man such as he. Um, but we have a short clip just to wrap up our show today of what he thought it meant to him uh, for being the first African American to win an Oscar. Check this out, guys. Check it out. I did Lilies of the Field. I had no thought of Oscar, none. But I was taken with the material. I was, I was overwhelmed with the possibility of trying to create this particular guy. And I did create him with no thought of Oscar. It was the farthest thing from my mind, I can tell you that. I knew, I just felt that I was not going to win. But of course, I was there to experience the presence and say to the, the winners. The winner is Sidney Poitier. Well, when my name was called, I had no idea it was going to happen. I leaped up from my chair and right there in the aisle, I was saying, I want, I want, I want. The, the receipt of the Oscar, there is no honor in the motion picture business that exemplifies all the things that one could possibly reach for. Because it is a long journey to this moment, I am naturally indebted to countless numbers of people, principally among whom are Ralph Nelson, James Poe, William Barrett, Martin Baum, and of course, the member of the Academy. For all of them, all I can say is a very special thank you. It was amazing. It was amazing, 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 amazing. So guys, uh, who better than to um, see at the end of the show when we're honoring someone as great um, and prestigious as Sidney Poitier. Um, we really hope that you enjoyed the show. We're definitely going to have more Legends and Icons series coming up. Um, as we always say, I will continue to plug this uh, till the time that we no longer do Scriptly Adapted, which will be never, uh, mm -hmm. but continue to support your local theaters, um, independent theaters especially, and we really appreciate you guys supporting us. Tune in and like all our social media. Thank you guys. <laughs> Take hope care. Hope you enjoyed the show. See you next time. Bye.